This is number six in a series of 22 Old Testament lectures on the chaotic kingdom stage, which is, of course, again, the seventh stage in Bible history. And at the beginning of the lectures, we said that the chaotic kingdom period could be best summarized by briefly examining the lives of 14 individuals. And thus far, we've looked at a number of these. We've seen something about the life of Rehoboam, who was the first king of the south, and Jeroboam, who was the first king of the north. And then we looked at Asa, who was the grandson of Rehoboam and the first saved king of the south. Remember, there were no saved kings of the north. And then Jehoshaphat, and then King Ahab, the seventh king of the north, a very ungodly man. And then the two prophets, Elijah and Elisha. And uh, so, basically, these are the individuals that we've looked at. Um, Elisha performs, as we've already said, some 14, some 13, I'm sorry, some 14 miracles. I'm looking at chapter 13. That's what's confusing me, I guess, here. And uh, then, of course, God calls him home by way of death. But his the final miracle that he performs, he performs it actually long after he's dead, that is, physically speaking, his body is dead, and certainly one of the strangest funerals of all time took place after his death. You might like to compare Second Kings chapter 13 with Revelation chapter 11, because this tells us about two very unusual funerals, I'll guarantee you. And in 2 Kings 13, verse 20, we read, And Elisha died, and they buried him. All right? And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. And it came to pass, as they were burying a man, that, behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. I wish the Bible would expand that more. That must have been quite an experience. You get the picture here. Here some poor fellow had died, and uh, so they're taking him to the cemetery to bury him, and the mourners are a little concerned because the rumor is that there's a Moabite rebellion, you know, the Indians are on the war path, and so let's, uh, let's watch out. And so they're rather timid about going out in a lonely spot like a graveyard anyway. And here they are carrying this fellow, and they've already dug a pit, and they're about to lower him in the uh, grave there. It's uh, possibly it was a great uh, large grave. And uh, suddenly the cry comes up, here come the Moabites. And so they're terrified, and they just, uh, they think, well, this guy's dead anyway. <laughs> He's not going to, they can't do anything to the corpse, but they can sure do a lot to us. And so they drop the poor fellow, and they uh, make uh, a beeline back to safety. And so the fellow falls, this corpse, lifeless corpse, falls headlong down into the grave, and somehow, uh, when they put him in the sepulcher, uh, he, uh, his flesh touches, touches the the bones, because the flesh of Elijah had already been dissolved, he'd been dead for some time now, the, uh, the body had, and uh, so they come in contact, uh, the bones of Elijah, with the uh, flesh of this uh, corpse, and it revived and stood up, and can you, you think they were frightened at that time, can't you just see this guy trying to climb out of the grave and say, hey, you guys, wait for me, <laughs> I want to go with you. Well, I don't know how fast they were going at that time, running from the Moabites, but I'll guarantee you they, they doubled their speed immediately. In fact, they might have taken off and, and did a little flying, uh, but that's rather amusing, and it, it really shows us, I guess, that the testimony of a man of God after his death is far more powerful than the uh, combined works of a lot of men while they're living. So at this point, rather amusing and yet thrilling story, we'll uh, leave the life of Elisha and go on toward, uh, go on in our study of uh, the important individuals in the chaotic kingdom stage. At this time, we discuss the only woman of that period that uh, we need to talk about, and I started to say the only lady, uh, but this 
gal was no lady, believe me, by any standard measurement. She was an ungodly woman by the name of Athaliah, A-T-H-A-L-I-A-H. And we've already said something about her before. Athaliah was the wicked daughter of King Ahab and Jezebel. And uh, she married Joram, J-O-R-A-M, who was the son of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat certainly uh, was out of the will of God when he allowed his son to marry this wicked girl. So uh, later on, of course, then he brings, when, uh, when Jehoshaphat dies, then Joram takes over and rules on the throne of David, and then he dies. And uh, so his son, whose name was Ahaziah, A-H-A-Z-I-A-H, who was Joram's son, then he sits upon the throne. And uh, he dies. So that would have been Athaliah's son. Well, now she's lost her husband and she's lost her son. As far as she's concerned, she's lost nothing because now she's in a position to gain that throne that her husband and her son had once occupied, namely the throne of David. But uh, there are other successors, of course, that are closer to this throne than what she is, and really she has no right to sit on it anyway. And so she, uh, that doesn't bother her a bit. She murders all the descendants of David with the exception of a little baby boy by the name of Joash, J-O-A-S-H. And uh, had it not been for the providential care of God, then God's redemptive plan would have uh, stopped right then, probably. You see, God told his people in the Old Testament that someday from the seed of David would come one that would rule over his people. Now, the devil certainly had his ears up, as it were, and he understood that. And so, time after time, you find Satan attempting to destroy or somehow stop the progress of this messianic line that will lead to Christ. And here he tries it. He almost succeeds. Had she been able to destroy Joash, uh, then, as I say, uh, God's original plan would have been frustrated. There would have been no way around it. And uh, the devil tried other ways. But some time ago in the Psalms, long before this took place, David wrote this about the Lord in Psalm 18, verse 28. He said, O Lord, thou will light my candle. Now, that's interesting. Here, uh, David depicts, in a sense, the plan of salvation uh, like a, a candle on a birthday cake and the cake of salvation. And God, uh, David is saying, Lord, you've told me that there will always be a candle burning until the Messiah comes and he'll rule forever on this salvation cake. You'll always keep my candle ignited. <clears throat> well, uh, David of course, grows old, and it comes time for him to die. And that candle that David had carried went out. But before he died, of course, Solomon, his son, had his candle burning, and he continued this light. And then Solomon died, and his light was put out. But before that light went out, uh, then his son Rehoboam continued the candle on the birthday cake of salvation. Now, obviously, Rehoboam was an unsaved man, but he still uh, held down a position in the messianic line, and so the candle continued on. And then here in the days of Athaliah, it almost went out, and Satan had blown all the candles but one out, but this little candle continued to burn. Well, we could trace this through the entire Old Testament and the genealogies of Matthew chapter 1. And then finally, the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world. All right, now, our Lord never married, and our Lord never had any children. And so finally, the devil, at least he felt, he had done this all by himself, succeeded in snuffing out, in extinguishing the light of Jesus. And I suppose when that happened, 
when they took the lifeless body of the Savior down from Gethsemane, that had you been tuned in properly, you could have heard the celebration that went on in hell from the moon. Now, the champagne corks were opened and all the uh, the uh, celebration was ready to go because now the light had finally been extinguished and there was no one to take Jesus' place. When he died, there was no light as there were when other men had died. At least their sons had carried on. But now the candle is out. And so it was. It was blown out. But you see what the devil didn't know is that God was using a trick candle. And some three days later, that candle that the devil had blown out came to life again and has been burning ever since. And later on, that golden, gracious, glorious candle himself, the Lord Jesus, would say to one of his apostles on the mount or on the Isle of Patmos, Fear not, I am he that was dead, but am alive and alive forevermore. Thank God for that candle. Thou will light my candle. Almost blown out now during the days of Athaliah, but God steps in. And the way he does this is rather remarkable, because when Athaliah murders her way to the throne of David, uh, her own daughter, whose name was uh, Jehosheba, J-E-H-O-S-H-E-B-A, apparently, as I try to piece this together, she might have been the stepdaughter, but apparently the scripture says actually that it's Athaliah's own daughter. Uh, she's married to Jehoiada, and that's J-E-H-O-I-A-D-A, -A, Jehoiada, and he's the high priest. So you here you have the godly daughter of this ungodly queen, and her godly husband, who's the high priest, and they love the Lord, and they realize that there's one little boy that Athaliah has not found and murdered, and his name is Joash. So they hide him out right under this wicked queen's nose for some six years. And then when he is seven years of age, uh, they have a special anointing, ceremony right outside the palace room, and they begin to cry out, God save the king, God save the king. Well, Athaliah hears that, and she comes running out, and she's extremely angry, and she cries out, treason, treason. Well, actually, she was the traitor, and so they have a crowd there waiting for her. She's arrested, and she's executed by one of David's own spears. Now, I think that's significant. Here they go to the museum there that they had in those days and pick out one of David's spears, perhaps the very sword that he used in killing Goliath. And this woman, who attempted to steal the throne of David, was herself later executed by one of David's own spears and swords. The law of retribution in the Bible. Joash then grows up and for a while becomes a pretty good king. I really won't discuss his life too much. He was not one of the main characters of the period, except to say I'm not sure whether he was saved or not. Uh, I said at the beginning there were six or eight saved kings of the south, none of the north. The reason I said six or eight because a few of them were not quite sure and when we get to heaven, we'll have to uh, search out, uh, wait by the eastern gate or any of the other 11 gates to find out if uh, Joash showed up, because we're not sure that he was saved. He did all right for a while, but uh, after the death of the high priest, the one who saved his life as a boy, Jehoiada, uh, Joash gets away from God, and Jehoiada had a godly son who became the high priest whose name was Zechariah. Of course, not the man who wrote the book of Zechariah. It's a different fellow. And you really have to have a scorecard at times to know what's going on. Did you know, for example, there are 28 Zacharias in the Bible? And here is a Zechariah who was a high priest, the godly son of Jehoiada. And uh, so he stands up 
And he fearlessly, like a Billy Sunday or a John the Baptist, he rebukes the leaders of Israel, including Joash, for their sin, getting away from God. And uh, then we have one of the darkest moments in Old Testament history because at the order of Joash, the king, he requires or he demands the stoning of Zechariah. As I said, it's the saddest moment in the Old Testament. God's people, the children of Israel, are guilty of murdering their own high priest. Of course, they'll do that later on in the New Testament. They'll be guilty of rexicide, the killing of one's own king, the Lord Jesus Christ. As he dies, Zechariah says this in 2 Chronicles 24, verse 22, And as he died, he said, May the Lord see and avenge. In other words, O God, avenge me upon them. What a contrast this is, 2 Chronicles 24, with Acts chapter 7. Here we have the martyr of another believer who had preached out against sin. His name was Stephen. But his dying words were totally different from Zacharias. Instead of saying, Oh, God, avenge me upon my enemies, he says, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. You see, the message of grace is far sweeter than the message of the law in the Old Testament. In Matthew 23, our Lord refers to the blood of righteous Zechariah slain at the altar. The next person that we want to study of the 14 during the chaotic kingdom stage is a man called Uzziah, U-Z-Z-I-A-H. Uzziah was a saved king. He ruled 52 years longer than any other saved king, and actually longer than any, any other southern king had ruled with the exception of one. He was the tenth king, Uzziah, and uh, he did more to strengthen Judah economically and militarily than any other previous king. He defeated most of Judah's enemies. He organized his army into peak fighting strength. Nobody picked on the uh, armies of Judah during Isaiah's time. He built towers and water reservoirs. He laid out farms and vineyards. He raised great herds of cattle. And this man was, uh, was a very, very uh, fine ruler and a very industrious man. But, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 26, verse 16, when he was strong... His heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord, his God, and went into the temple to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Now, as I said before, God demanded in the Old Testament the recognition and separation of church and state. His kings especially were not to be priests. Only one person has God ever entrusted to be prophet, priest, and king, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, some time ago, I saw a little sign, I think, in a McDonald's restaurant, and uh, the sign says, Dear friend, we have an agreement with the bank. They don't cook hamburgers. We don't cast checks. In other words, they have their thing, and they do it well, and we have our thing, and we try to do it well also. And so, really, that's what God was saying here, all right, uh, you kings, you do your thing, and you don't bother the priests. You pray for them, help them, support them, but you let them do their things. And you priests, you don't attempt to rule upon the throne. You pray for that king, but uh, you are not to be that king. So Isaiah one morning decides, I'll go to the temple and I'll offer incense like the priest. I want to be a priest as well as being a king. Well, the high priest confronted him with this, and Isaiah is extremely angry because they're telling off the king. 
And what does this priest know about a king's job anyway? And so he picks up the golden censer. That was sort of like a skillet, and you had coals of fire in it and everything. It was hot, and he picked that up, and he started to throw it at the godly high priest, and with a shriek of pain, he dropped it on the floor because at that instant, God uh, cursed him with leprosy. That is to say, he judged him with the disease of leprosy. And we're told this sad verse in Second Chronicles chapter 26 and uh, verse 21, we're told, And Uzziah the king was a leper unto the day of his death, and dwelt in a separate house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. I want to repeat, and I think I've done this ten times, but I need to hear it the eleventh time, and you need to hear it too, the statement that the Apostle Paul made in 1 Corinthians 9. I think Paul must have had men like Uzziah, perhaps, and uh, Samson, and other men in mind when he said, I keep under my body, I buffet it, lest that when I have preached to others, I myself become a castaway. He died a lonely leper in a home separated from the main city. During the summer of 1975, I spent in the Middle East, and I enrolled in the American Institute of Holy Land Studies on Mount Zion. I took a course in historical geography. An archaeology teacher over there told the class that some time ago the archaeologist had discovered in between Jerusalem and Bethlehem uh, two or three miles removed from the city walls of Jerusalem, the remains of a palace, a small palace. And apparently a very important person had once lived there, and they couldn't quite figure it out for a while. Why would a person uh, live out there in the desert, uh, away from the protective walls of the city of Jerusalem and the conveniences of the city? And they couldn't understand it because apparently from the layout of the palace and some of the uh, things they found among the ruins uh, that whoever lived there was a very important person. Why would he choose to live outside the walls? And then they found a personal artifact with the inscription, Property of King Uzziah, and that was written on it. And so once again, archaeology has confirmed the record of the Bible. All right, so much for Uzziah, the 10th king. Now, the 13th king of the south. Remember, we do not examine any of the kings of the north with the exception of uh, Jeroboam because he was the first king and Ahab because he was the seventh and because he came into contact with uh, Elijah the prophet. So they're not important, but the kings of the south are. The 13th king was Hezekiah. He rules for 29 years. Hezekiah was the most spiritual king since King David, according to the Bible, up to that time, and he's also the most wealthy king since Solomon. So he had money, he had riches, and he had brains, and he had a heart that loved God. Hezekiah led his people in a great revival when he took over by reopening and repairing the temple and by cleansing the land of idols. Now, this usually gave the people in Jerusalem a tip-off concerning what of king they now had when the fellow took over, and they watched him carefully, and if he would make his way to the temple and order the temple to be reopened and repaired and repainted and for the sacrifices to uh, be uh, opened and to, to continue, uh, then uh, the people of the city of Jerusalem knew that it was going to be a pretty smooth ride because his heart was right and he was going to serve God. But if he didn't, and then they knew they better buckle their seat belts because there was going to be a lot of turbulence for the next few years. Not only does he cleanse the temple, but we said already he cleanses the land from idols, including the destruction of the brazen serpent. Now, apparently this had been kept since the days of Moses, and Numbers 21, do you remember the children of Israel uh, were in the desert, and once again they had sinned against God. 
They rebelled about three times daily, it seemed, uh, at 10, 2, and 4, you know, like Dr. Pepper, and they had a rebellion service. And so this time God sent poisonous serpents, and the serpents were biting the people. And then the people repented, and God said, all right, I'll forgive their sin, but I'm not going to take away the disease or the cause for this uh, problem. Uh, I've been sending uh, poisonous serpents to bite the people for their sin, but I am going to provide a cure. Now, what you're to do, Moses, is to cut down a tree and strip the bark from it, and then to take a few pounds of brass, and you watch one of those serpents as it makes its way along, and I suppose Moses had been watching him very carefully, and I want you to twist and shape that, that little pile of brass until it resembles one of those serpents, and I want you to tie it on to the end of that pole and dig a hole in the ground and put that pole with that serpent tied on the end of it in the uh, pole, uh, in the hole there, I should say. And then it comes to pass, it'll come to pass that anyone bitten by a serpent, all he has to do to be saved of that serpent bite is to look upon that brazen serpent on that pole. Of course, this is a type of salvation in the New Testament. Our Lord Jesus used Numbers 21, the illustration or the historical event there, as an illustration to lead Nicodemus to Christ. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up also. But we're saying here that for some years, well, actually at this time, it would have been, see, Hezekiah lived probably during the 7th century, and Moses put this thing up about the 14th century B.C. We're talking about six, 700 years that the brazen serpent or the serpent of brass had been kept. But uh, as is common to men, sometimes they become idolaters and they worship good things. And uh, so what they were doing here is uh, bowing down and worshiping this uh, serpent of brass. So he had it destroyed. And I think this might answer a question that uh, many people have, especially students have, when you start teaching the doctrine of the Bible, uh, how we got our Bible, uh, you make the statement, of course, that we have no original writing of the Bible uh, in our hands today. All we have is copies of copies of copies. Now, of course, there's a thrilling story connected with that, how God has preserved these copies, and so we can still hold our a uh, copy of the Word of God, and said, I have in my hands the very Word of God, infallible, without any mistakes. But uh, why do not we have, why did God not allow the original uh, book of Genesis to be spared? He could have done that, and then we have had no problem with Bible criticism. We have had no problem with uh, Bible, you know, uh, uh, archaeology attempting to, the uh, Bible, well, what I'm saying is attempting to discover the true message of the Bible, we would have had the original copy to go to. And I think this passage in Second Kings 18 probably explains that. Had God allowed the 66 books of the Bible to uh, be preserved, I suppose we would have had the 66 denominations today, and each denomination would claim as their, uh, for their fame, we have the book of Genesis and therefore uh, we're going to worship that and we'll be known as the Genesisites and then the Exodusites and on and on and on. So that may be one of the reasons. At any rate, he destroys the brazen serpent. And then Hezekiah planned for and carried out the greatest Passover service since the days of Solomon. And what a, what a great service this was. He appoints a temple, a temple orchestra group. He organizes it. And then a Levitical singing group numbering 288 singing Levitical priests was appointed. And they featured the Psalms of David in their repertoire. And then upon completion of all this, letters of invitation were sent out by Hezekiah to all Judah and all parts of Israel inviting them to repent, to return, and to rejoice. He sends out letters not only to those in Judah, but also those in uh, the northern cities of Israel, inviting them to come. And the Bible says some ridiculed it. Just like in the New Testament when our Lord tells a story of the king who prepared a feast, 
And he sent out his ambassadors, inviting everybody to come to the feast. Some came, but others ridiculed it. And that's, of course, always the story of the message of salvation. Some will respond. Some will receive it. Others will ridicule it. But a number did receive it, even from the north, and they came down. And we read in Second Chronicles 29, verses 27 and 28, And Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offerings upon the altar. And when the burnt offerings, a uh, burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also with the trumpets and with the instruments ordained by David, king of Israel, and all the congregation worshiped and the singers sang and the trumpets shouted, sounded, and all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. What a glory, hallelujah hour this must have been. In Second Chronicles 30, verse 26, we read, So there was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the time of Solomon, king of Israel, there was not the like in Jerusalem. And as a result of all this, in Second Chronicles 31, after everything was over, uh, then Hezekiah did what many pastors do. He checked with his treasure. He says, well, how's things in your department? How did we do as far as the offering is concerned? A lot of people were saved and Christians got right with God. What about the offering? Well, the chief priest who took care of this, his name was uh, Azra, A-Z-A-R-I-A-H. And Azra, the chief priest of the house of Zadok, answered Hezekiah and said, since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, we have enough to eat and have plenty left. For the Lord hath blessed his people, and that which is left is this great store. And that's, that's beautiful here. When the house of God is put in order, then the tithes of the Lord will come in. Now, a little later, Hezekiah, this great king, has a real traumatic experience in his life. He's stricken with a fatal boil-like disease, maybe due to his pride. The Bible seems to hint that. At any rate, God tells him he's going to die, and he turns his back to the wall. And he begins to pray and ask God to preserve his life. God hears his prayer, and God promises Hezekiah an additional 15 years. By the way, Hezekiah becomes the only man ever to live who could absolutely, with perfect confidence, go to bed on a given night and know beyond the shadow of a doubt that he would be able to see the sunrise the next morning. You see, you and I have no assurance whatsoever concerning that. We think of the, term, the words of the Bible, Boast not thyself about tomorrow, thou knowest not what a day brings forth. But for 15 years, Hezekiah could make some kind of plans for the next day because he might not have known what the next day would hold, he did know that he'd be alive to see it. And, of course, we do not have that assurance. Well, to prove that God was going to give him this 15 years, God, at Hezekiah's request, has the shadow on the sundial to go back 10 degrees. And this is a great miracle in the Bible, too, and it sort of ties in with Joshua chapter 10, where the sun uh, was uh, stopped in its tracks or whatever happened there in that great miracle when Joshua sh said, Son, stand thou still upon the, of course, the, the, Mount, the, the valley of Agilon. And this ties into uh, this chapter in Second Chronicles here. All right, uh, about this time, we're not quite sure of the chronology, but about this time, Hezekiah receives some foreign ambassadors from Babylon. Now, uh, Babylon was a rising power. Of course, Assyria was still the, the uh, big power of the day, but Babylon would soon be challenging Assyria concerning the right to rule in the Middle East. But uh, 
uh, the Babylonians now come to the city of Jerusalem, and apparently they come for three reasons. Number one, for courtesy purposes, because here is the head of one foreign state who learns about the sickness and the recovery of uh, another head of state, and so he simply sends uh, his ambassadors to congratulate. And out of courtesy, we heard that you're sick and we're we're glad that you're well now. And then secondly, they came out of curiosity because they had heard not only of the sickness, but they heard of this miraculous sign that the sundial, it had been reported, had gone back 10 degrees. Now, this had to do with the sun, of course, and the Babylonians were the astrologers and astronomers of the day, and their religion was pretty well based around the movement of the stars and the sun. And so they came not only out of courtesy, but out of curiosity. They would they wanted to know just what went on, because apparently this sign of the sun going back, uh, the effects were not visible or manifest in Babylon as they were in Palestine. It was a local miracle. So they come out of courtesy, out of curiosity, and finally out of carnality. They had an ulterior motive. They wanted to check out the wealth of the city of Jerusalem and the political uh, situation of the day because later on, of course, they were planning uh, some uh, invasions of their own and they wanted to know how much they could uh, gleam if they would choose to invade the city of Jerusalem. And really, like an idiot, Hezekiah showed them all the wealth the temple wealth and everything, he really laid it on thick of the uh, city of Jerusalem. And when he left, or when they left, and went back to Babylon, uh, then Isaiah the prophet asked Hezekiah what he had done. And Hezekiah told him, he said, Hezekiah, that is crazy. He said, someday the Babylonians will defeat the Assyrians, and they'll be the number one power, and they will not forget what they've seen today, They'll come and invade the land of Judah and Jerusalem and take that from the temple. That'll happen years later, not during your life, but years later. And Hezekiah, a godly king normally, but now he makes an absolutely unbelievable, utterly selfish statement. Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, 2 Kings 20, verse 19, after he heard that. Good is the word of the Lord, which thou hast spoken. Is it not good if peace and truth be in my day? Well, that's fine. Uh, You know what you've told me is good news, because uh, I would certainly hate to be around when Jerusalem is destroyed and when this temple is uh, taken from the, I mean, when the gold is taken from the temple. But Uh, it's a good thing, it's not going to happen during my day. Again, this simply, I think, reemphasizes the statement of the Apostle Paul, written concerning believers, by the way, in Romans 7, when he said, I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, there dwelleth no good thing. Well, shortly after this, Jerusalem is now surrounded by the Assyrians. As I said, the Assyrians were the leaders, or were the uh, uh, powerful armies of the day. And the year is shortly after 721 B.C. That's an important year because right before that, the final king of the north, whose name was Hashia, H-O-S-H-E-A, was taken prison, prisoner by the Assyrians, and the northern ten tribes were carried into captivity. And then the Assyrians determined just to move down south, and they surround the city of Jerusalem, and they're going to take it also, they think, as they've taken the northern cities. And Jerusalem in those days was in dire straits, you could almost take a, a black sheet of paper and uh, trace out the map of Palestine on that black sheet of paper, 
And then in the middle of that black sheet of paper, uh, you could put a little white dot and label it Jerusalem. And that's about what it looked like because the land was overrun by the uh, Assyrians. And on basically the only important city remaining unconquered was the city of Jerusalem. And uh, there was no chance whatsoever for this city to escape. And the king of the Assyrians in those days was a man called Sennacherib, very ungodly man. Of course, all Assyrian kings were, but he's a very cruel man. And so he then determined the destruction of Jerusalem as highest priority on his, on his list. So the big battering rams were brought into play, and the Assyrians had... Uh, sort of uh, polished up, as it were, and perfected the art of uh, besieging a city, these gigantic logs that would ram into walls, and there was no wall of the day made of stone and mortar able to withstand the battering after so many days or weeks. And so they were totally, had totally surrounded the city of Jerusalem. Well, Hezekiah, of course, then does what you and I would do. He goes to the temple and he gets down on his knees and he cries out for deliverance. And during his prayer, God sends Isaiah the prophet to speak to him. And here is what God said through Isaiah to Hezekiah. He says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with a shield, nor cast a mound against it, by the way that he came, by the same he shall return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Remember, he said, notice, not one enemy arrow shall enter into the city. Not only will they not break down the walls and come in, but not even one arrow. There must have been a half a million troops each each trooper must have had a hundred arrows. We're talking about 50 million arrows. And you mean to say not one Assyrian G.I. Joe is going to use a little target practice on the night before and shoot one of those arrows into the city? That's what Isaiah said. The next morning, of course, when Reveille was sounded, 185,000 Assyrian troops did not answer the call because that night, God's death angel, the angel of the Lord, passed through the Assyrian host and slaughtered them. And the Bible, both secular and sacred history, tells us. Uh, then Sennacherib left hurriedly not only the city of Jerusalem but the entire land of Palestine and made his way back totally defeated to Assyria where he himself was later murdered by one of his own sons. With this, we end this lecture on the chaotic kingdom stage.